Uh, message out that I want to um, teach my students. So Joe, you are a camera person. We've actually looked at a few videos camera where right we're looking at the different roles of production. Everyone has to fill a particular role, the actors, the camera you're person, the lighting. Me. So you're those kind of the videos help to get the kids more knowledgeable of what they're supposed to be doing in our class. You're watching New England Public Media on WGBY Springfield. This is a story in which everyone is challenged. We all think of the United States as this country with the Statue of Liberty poem, Give Me Your Tired, Your Poor. But in moments of crisis, it becomes very hard for us to live up to it. It is a story that Americans have to reckon with. The U.S. and the Holocaust premieres September 18th on NEBM. Coming up, we're connecting you with the creativity and culture in your community, including an artist who uses her work to help heal wounds from the devastation of Hurricane Maria. When you paint, you zoom in and you forget because the mind can only think of one thing at a time. Love blueberries? So do we. We'll visit a farm where you can find this annual summertime tree. Put your scoop in and gradually tilt it and pull it back. And we'll look back at the life and work of a man responsible for an iconic image in pop culture history. So I took a razor blade and I cut those shapes out. I had all these little pieces and I put it on red paper and that was it. Join us for those stories and more as we explore the creativity, culture and community that make us Western New England. Up next on Connecting Point. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. Welcome, and thanks for joining us for Connecting Point, your source for creativity, culture, and community. I'm Saidalis Bauer. Each week this summer, we're exploring all that Western New England has to offer, and today we're coming to you from Holyoke, Massachusetts, and Wisteria Hearst Museum, the former home of the Skinner family who operated a successful silk manufacturing business. Wisteria Hearst was originally built in Williamsburg in 1868. The house was moved in 1874 to the city of Holyoke following flooding which devastated the Skinner Mills. Now owned and operated by the city, it's been open to the public as a museum since 1959 and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The museum is dedicated to preserving Holyoke's history and does so through its educational programs, exhibits and events. You can come to Holyoke and experience all that Wisteria Hearst has to offer for yourself, but our first story today takes place in the town of Granville, Massachusetts. If you love fresh, wild blueberries, hopefully you had a chance to enjoy some this summer, maybe poured over some ice cream or in one of your favorite baked goods. The blueberry season is a short one in Massachusetts, starting around mid-July and lasting just three or four weeks. Sadly, there are only a few low bush blueberry farms left in the Commonwealth. Producer Dave Frazier paid a visit to one such farm still in operation, Sandman's Wild Blueberries, and brings us this story. High on a hill in Granville, Massachusetts sits a 30 acre field of wild low bush blueberries. These hardy low berries are generally smaller than their high bush cousins and, say their advocates, are juicier and more flavorful. For Gordon Sandman, Harvesting low bush blueberries on this land yeah, nice dates back as far as he can remember. My folks bought the, the land from my grandfather and I got it from them. So there's actually like at least four generations here and probably more. Put your scoop in and gradually tilt it and pull it back. I've been doing it since I was five years old. Quality control. It's what my family did, and I was in retail for a lot of years, and I just retired out of that and said, this is what I'm going to do. The low bush blueberries grow low to the ground in sunny, dry uplands. They are harvested by running a scoop through the plant, being careful not to take too much grass. Once the scoop is full, the berries are dumped into a box and covered to prevent discoloration. The picking day starts early. I get out here, I get the boxes ready for the pickers to roll in. And we head out and start picking. The cleaning crew comes in here. If we have berries ready for them, they start cleaning. And this 
machine starts humming and it doesn't stop until the end of the day. Oh, you're watching Eric? He's dumping the berries in here. Okay, they fall down. We have a belt turning the opposite way where a lot of the stems and clumps and green ones go out into a trash bucket here. The good berries come down on the grading belt where they pick out everything that's not supposed to go into that box. Sandman's wild blueberries is one of only a handful of low bush blueberry harvesters left in the state. Back in the day, say in the late 50s, early 60s, everybody had a blueberry farm here. And due to circumstances, we had a lot of um, weed control problems, disease problems. Um, they started just fading out, diminishing. There's two of us left in town here, and there's probably only four left in the state. My daughter and son-in-law are very much interested in it now, so that makes me feel good. It's a family business, and family is very important to me, so carrying that on, um, family tradition. And then there's so much potential with the blueberries. Um, my dad has a vision of what he thinks this farm can be, and I know that it has a lot more potential, so adding on those value-added products and going into experimenting with wine, looking into that, looking into jams and other products that we can make with the blueberries, too. The blueberries from Sandman's make their way into the recipes of a lot of local establishments, including cocktails at the bar shop and ice cream sundaes at the summer house in Southwick. Our business has been around for 42 years. They're in the fourth or fifth generation of blueberry farming for their family. So it kind of just was logical that we would go with a local business and try to support them because so many people have supported us and our small business also. We use it on blueberry sundaes, a blueberry shortcake sundae, and it's been very, very popular. After 32 days of picking, the blueberry season at Sandman's is officially done for the season, according to their Facebook page. Every year brings its challenges, they say, but it is a labor of love and one they look forward to year after year. Well, it's a hectic three weeks. If I get more than three weeks, I'm a happy guy. Less than three weeks, not so much so. Just keep plugging away at it and putting whatever money we make right back into it so that every year we get better and better and better. Every week, Connecting Point explores the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. But it doesn't stop there. You can find us online anytime for exclusive features and content. New England is home to over a thousand dairy farms, and you can find them throughout the Berkshires, Pioneer Valley, and Southern Vermont. And while that industry has seen a decline over the past several years, many farms still carry on the tradition. Producer Dave Frazier visited one in South Hadley to learn how it has survived for more than 200 years in this week's digital exclusive. The dairy supply chain is very fast and clean and efficient, and I think it's really important to note that it's super local because milk is so perishable. So these processing plants are set up to make a lot of different things from cottage cheese and whipped cream to butter and fluid milk, and also a lot of different brands. So our milk is ending up on the grocery store shelf right here in the valley. You can find that digital exclusive online right now at nepm.org slash connecting point. This year marks the fifth anniversary of Hurricane Maria, which devastated the islands of Puerto Rico and its residents. Artist Alvilda Sofia Anaya Alegria experienced that devastation firsthand and has turned to art to both document and heal from the trauma this natural disaster caused. I visited Anaya Alegria to hear her story and learn how she was able to channel the cultural beliefs of her ancestors to begin healing. September 11, 2017, we had Huracan Maria right after the other Hurricane Irma. So when Maria comes, there's no other place to put water in, right? Um, so we have this container that is the island, just getting water and sucking everything in. And for me, when I started to paint, they bring in that whole conversation about being engulfed, uh, atragantados of, with, with all of this water and you're just holding your breath and you're trying to hold those elements outside of you, but at the same time, all the windows are rattling and water is coming through them. 
And how are you able to express that emotion in your paintings through the techniques, the tools, and the colors that you use? How does that come across? What I ended up having to do was to sit and embrace my inner pain. I'm from Guayama, Puerto Rico, and as a professor, I kept thinking, how am I going to offer something visual to the community, to my students, to anybody who looks at this work, and have them think about where are those pieces coming from. So for example, the blue that I'm using is the blue that you see in Guayama because the sun hits the island around. So all the colors in the four points are different. The latitude of the sun makes the colors vibrate in a different color. So for example, Guayama has this blue, but Ponce has a different kind of blue when the sun is coming up or going down. Same thing with Cabo Rojo, which is the colors are purple and orange and bright orange, like at Rincón, you know, and, and you go, oh my goodness, this, this is just amazing. So I, I, the first thing I do was take out all those colors that meant um, my hometown flag, which is yellow, black, and red. And I said, okay, so I'm gonna take these three colors, the water and the ocean color, which is blue, and I'm gonna keep those separate. And I'm gonna start with that. And I started just scraping the paintings um, with tools rather than with brushes. And I started to scrape because um, for me, there was this sound in my ear of the windows scraping, the water scraping the windows. And I needed that scraping on the canvas. So you see a lot of white, um, a lot of lines, um, just that, that don't have anything, but they have that movement in. So that's part of the sound that people need to bring on their own when they're looking at the work. And I know that you describe this artwork for you as a center of healing. So what, what do you think it is about artwork that it has that power to offer um, that type of healing for an individual? Um, when you paint, you zoom in and you forget because the mind can only think of one thing at a time. And I didn't know that. I didn't understand how for example, when you listen to music, you forget about everything else, but the lyrics, right? So the same thing happens when you're painting. And for me, um, as I was painting, I was crying. And I was shivering, and I was vomiting, and I was, um, uh, all the post-traumatic stress that I lived through, I was re-feeling it. I would cry for days. I would paint one part and cry for days and there were moments I couldn't paint for three and six weeks. There were moments where I couldn't paint for nine months. And so knowing all that you went through just to be able to paint these murals and how long it took you, what would you like other people who view it, what do you want them to take away from it? What conversations do you want these pieces to ignite? I want people to know that we lost 4,654 people and that was an unnecessary. People were dying from diabetes, dying from heart attacks, dying because they didn't have the pump to do their kidney dialysis, not at, not, not at home, not at the hospitals. Um, people were being saved according to who could survive more, uh, who was younger. Then we ended up having a lot of suicides because the older community were like, we lost our family because then people started leaving the island also and they were left alone because if somebody had to leave, it had to be the mom with the children, right? And I want people to remember those stories. It's not just looking at the images behind me or in front of you or, you know, it's, it's what happened and do you care? And if anything, you know, I see these images as like altars where you can just sit in front of them and cry. 
you can bring your chancletas and 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 dance also and celebrate the dead and celebrate the lives of people that you loved. Um, you know, you can heal in community, um, making circles in front of these pieces and they'll hum to you because they have that power of movement that I have put through them. Pioneer Valley-based artist Arnold Skolnick, whose iconic poster for the 1969 Woodstock Concert Festival became a pop culture touchstone for graphic design, passed away in June of this year. Connecting Point producer Dave Frazier visited Skolnick at his East Hampton studio in 2019 to hear all about the artist's life and career from the man himself. You're born with this talent or you don't have it. You can't learn how to do it. Arnold Skolnick has spent his life designing and creating beautiful pieces of art as well as producing art books, catalogs, and posters. At age 82, he has received four 50 Best Books of the Year awards from the American Institute of Graphic Arts and numerous awards for advertising and graphic design. But his most famous work is one that received no award at all, the original Woodstock poster, which he created 50 years ago in 1969. It's just the bird, the hand, the, and the guitar. And this is what we went and added the, the uh, Woodstock Art Fair, the, uh, all the names. And the, the, they were driving the printer crazy because each time you had to change the plates. The festival attracted nearly half a million people to a farm in upstate New York for three days of peace, love, and music. For some reason, the whole country knew about this fight and they started coming here from all over the country. If you, if you remember, the throughway was packed, they had to close everything down, so it just it, it took off. Skolnick got the job to design the poster because the original poster, designed by David Byrd, featured an outline of a naked woman and was too psychedelic. The promoters needed to make a change and approached Skolnick to create a new poster in just three days. Inspired by the paper cutouts of Henry Matisse, Arnold got to work. Thinking about Matisse's cutout shows that I had at the Museum of Modern Art. So I took a razor blade and I cut those shapes out. I, I went to the store and bought a big sheet of red paper. I, I put the bird in the upper left-hand corner. And I put the type in the lower right-hand corner so it balances. I put it, cut it all out of, uh, with a razor blade. I had all these little pieces and I put it on red paper and that was it. Those simple graphics came together to make one of the most iconic music posters ever. And despite Skolnick's lack of interest in the music of the 60s and 70s, he is quite proud of his work, but admits it isn't perfect. There's a mistake in the poster. When I put all the colors in for the printer, I didn't mark the beak to be black. So the beak is red, red background. Nobody, nobody's ever noticed it. Skolnick had a VIP pass for the three-day festival, but left after the first day. I ended up spending a lot of time on the stage, in the back of the stage. Janice Chaplin and all, you know. But I was so much going on, I, I, I never saw so many people. 450,000 people. It's the size of small cities in the United States. It's incredible. Then I found out that it's going to rain, and it's going to start to rain the next day which it did, I said, well, I gotta get out of here. We got into the, the Volvo, and I must have damaged 20 cars getting out of the parking lot. It was just, it was just madness, you know, and the Volvo can push anything, you know. Most of the work that Skolnick has produced comes with a backstory, like his series of books on Maine, or how he helped Ralph Nader design the cover of his book about cars while waiting to see his publisher. The publisher came out and he said, Arnold, give us five more minutes. While, uh, while you're waiting, take a look at these ideas for a book we were doing with Ralph Nader. And on the table is ideas about how, what to do with your bad car. That was the, right? And it, it was one dumb idea after another. A guy fixing the car, the feet coming out from underneath. I said, just put a lemon on wheels. And the place froze. Nobody said a word. And he came out and he said, can you repeat that? Put a lemon on wheels. Get Ralph Nader on the phone, they said. 
So I got Ralph Nader on the phone, and I, I told him about the issues, do it. Using a toy truck and a lemon he bought at his local fruit market, Skolnick created the image that helped change our modern vernacular about bad cars. The stories of the famous Woodstock poster have changed over time, and Skolnick has become somewhat of an internet legend in the poster-making world. But it was just another job for him, and if he had to do it all over again... He gave me another assignment to do another one. I couldn't do it better than, better than that. It just happened to click, you know? And the idea of a poster, you should be able to ride by and in a second, find out what it's, what it's about. You don't need all the psychedelic nonsense, you know? The Springfield Museum's latest exhibit entitled Card Tricks, Salvador Dali and the Art of Playing Cards is currently on exhibit through November 20th in the Damore Museum of Fine Arts. Playing cards have been around for hundreds of years and the exhibit explores Dali's surrealist contribution to this popular pastime with his unique limited edition designs as well as through card decks designed by artists working today. I spoke with Maggie North, Curator of Art at the Springfield Museums, to learn more. We're really excited to share this work with the public, and it's an opportunity for us to share works on paper from our permanent collection, which can't always be on view because of their light sensitivity, but we do try to rotate them through our gallery spaces every so often. Um, I actually must admit that I was unaware that we had these prints until I stumbled on a record for them in our database, and we didn't have great images in the database, so I wasn't exactly sure what I had come across. But once I investigated a little bit further, I was really excited to see that we had eight um, examples from a suite of 17 prints that Salvador Dali created in the 1970s that really emulated and reinterpreted playing card designs. So they include wonderful depictions of Dali's own imaginings of what queens and jacks and king face cards could look like, as well as aces. You describe this exhibit as small but mighty. So in your opinion, um, what makes this exhibition so robust? This exhibit really encourages creativity. It showcases the ways in which a sort of standard design can be reinterpreted, reimagined, remade throughout the decades and throughout the centuries. And as the curator of this exhibition, it was important to me to also include several examples of contemporary card decks that were designed by artists working right now and were really made in the past 10 years. Because as we can see, artists continue to reimagine playing cards and many other objects that we think we know. Absolutely. And I know that you mentioned to me that um, you personally love Dali's surrealist work and his interpretation of the playing cards. Um, so which one is your favorite in this collection? Oh, it's a good question. There's a number that I like, but I would have to say that the Ace of Diamonds, which is hung at the center of the exhibition, so you'll see it just as you walk through the door, is one of my favorites. It depicts an Ace card, but included is one of Dolly's famous melting clocks. And that's a motif that is recognizable as a surrealist motif and has really come to represent the strange quality of time as something that is transient and sort of malleable. Um, time doesn't always feel the same as we've all discovered it after living through the pandemic for two years. So I think that even though it's an old motif, it has new resonance and um, continued importance within art history. Uh, and it's just a really fun image. But there are so many other great examples of Dali's interpretations of playing cards. There's a Jack who wears a boat for a hat, a king whose castle is upside down, um, and examples of strange but familiar objects such as keys and drawers appearing within the garments of the noble figures represented on the face cards. So there's really a lot to hunt for as you're looking through these images. And I know that um, the other cards on exhibit that you were talking about that have been made by artists working today, those are some powerful um, cards as well. Talk to us about what some of those um, playing cards represent in the exhibit. These playing cards are really wonderful and they really are just a small selection 
of the amazing variety that's out there today when you Google or you go on Etsy and search for contemporary playing cards. Um, included in the display are playing cards that are designed by Kira Johnson, who replaces the traditional face cards with influential figures from American history who have made strides in African American and Black history and culture. So figures from Malcolm X to Michelle Obama. There are also cards in the exhibition that feature colorful line drawings by Chantelle Martin, and these are really a celebration of LGBTQ plus pride. We have cards on view that illustrate Japanese tattooing traditions, and also one of my favorites is a deck of cards designed by an artist named Rico Whirl, um, who celebrates and depicts images that are central to Indigenous cultures from the Pacific Pacific North, I'm sorry, from the Pacific Coast. So these are a deck of Raven inspired playing cards. I love that. You know, when you think of art, sometimes you think of something framed or, you know, sculptures. So just to see this interpretation be on a playing card that people love to use every day is so cool. As curator of this exhibition, um, what are you most proud of? I think I'm most proud of the fact that we were able to create this dialogue between Dali's interpretation of the playing card, the history of playing cards, and these contemporary playing cards. Because although Dali is at the center of the exhibition title, this is an exhibition that is more broadly about the creative and playful history of cards and the ways in which cards will continue to be reinvented years and years into the future. And that does it for this edition of Connecting Point. Remember, you can always find all of the stories that you saw in this episode, as well as exclusive features, digital-only content, and so much more online anytime at nepm.org slash connecting point. Our thanks to Wisteria Hearst Museum in Holyoke for hosting us today. And please be sure to join us again every week right here for more stories of the creativity, culture, and community that make us Western New England. I'm Saivalis Bauer. Thanks for watching and take care. Support for Connecting Point is provided by our contributing viewers. is the dark lady of Shakespeare's sonnets. Let me tell you about Black Lucy Negro. Her story comes to life in a modern twist on a secret tryst. Based on the book by Caroline Randall Williams. Choreographed by Paul Vasterling with music by Rhiannon Giddens and Francesco Teresi. The Nashville Ballet performs Black Lucy and the Bard on great performances. Watch live September 16th or stream at nepm.org. When you're depressed, man, the only thing you can think about is yourself, what's eating you up inside. I've been faced with depression, and without the help from my two best friends, I wouldn't be standing in front of you here today. The way that you start a contagion of hope is to start spreading stories of recovery. Finding a way to connect with them keeps them alive. Watch Facing Suicide Tuesday at 9 on NEPM. Kids brings the whole world right to us. We especially love Alma's way. Alma lives in the Bronx with her family. They speak Spanglish. They're all different colors, which is really cool for our kids to see because they don't really look related, but we're all one big family. What When your kids see people talking like you and looking like you, it makes them feel like they're a part of something bigger. It's helped them understand themselves, and we really love and appreciate that. How can we learn from the past? It is a story that Americans are challenged with all the time. It's haunting, cruel, tragic, threatening, shocking, unbelievable, evil, illogical, xenophobic, genocidal, danger, death. But that's not all there is to this story. 
the U.S. and the Holocaust premieres September 18th on NEBM. Lo importante es que aprendáis a escucharos. Dime, por favor, que esta no eres tú. Stream now on Passport when you become an NEPM member at nepm.org. You're watching New England Public Media, WGBY Springfield. Is it not strange how evil can find its roots so easily in an English village? A place of beauty and tranquility. And yet, converging from all sides. Violence and death. You wish to know the answer? Are you kidding? That's all I want to know. Magpie Murder is part of all new Sunday Night Dramas in October on NEPM.